Welcome back, my friends, to the sweet spot where IT leaders share the insight with other leaders and others who want to lead. My name is Carlos Vargas, and as in every week, I have my two co-hosts, Howard Holton and Paul Lewis. Hey there. How are we doing, guys? Doing okay. Doing okay. End to another busy week. Busy, busy, busy. An end, but also a start. So I've spent the week negotiating uh, home renovations with a contractor. Uh, there was a variety of things that need to get done. Some fixed, some new. Um, and since I don't have a, um, a means in my skill set or experience or expertise, I actually do any of it on my own. I have to rely on the expertise of others. It has been an interesting journey and in how detailed I think the contract should be versus what they think the contract should be. <laughs> <laughs> when the start and end times should be, what they think is reasonable <laughs> versus what I think is reasonable. Um, and then of course the payment terms, what uh, what I think should be held back and what they think, think should be held back. But it, it's been an interesting journey over this week of going through that process. And, and do you have negotiating ability or do they just kind of go like, I'm sorry, I got 27 jobs lined up after this, I'm out. While that has been true, um, it, it, the contract terms are far more detailed than they were before. Um, uh, we, we both gave a little on the terms um, and the dates. I really didn't have a lot of opinion. Well, I had a lot of opinion on, but I didn't have a lot of negotiating power because I right. didn't want to do any of the work. <laughs> so they could easily steamroll what they think duration should look like. Wait, what am I going to do? I can't argue with them. I've never done it before. <laughs> nice. Nice. So it's a, a little give or take. I, it's the detail that mattered me the most, right? It's it can't be fixed floor, right, or change window. <laughs> it's got to like give me some, give me a room, list a room, maybe some dimensions. Yeah, yeah, don't it's pick, actually kind of funny. A window at random. I want this window changed. Right. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I, I'm kind of going through the same thing. I've got a um, I've got a, a wood a, I don't know woodworker cabinet maker finishing up my my bar downstairs, right? Um, we had this little like space in our kitchen that wasn't used for anything that I ended up turning into a bar. Nice. Um, and every step was a negotiation against myself, <laughs> by which I mean, there was no part of it I could not do myself, okay. except find the time to do it myself. Right. And so, so the whole project started, I mapped out, knew what I wanted, kind of the whole thing. And then my wife goes, okay, cool. Are you going to start on that? And I went, absolutely. I had the best intentions in the world. And then a week would go by and she's like, okay, so are you said you were going to start on that. Are you actually going to start on that? Absolutely. And finally I went, just call a guy. <laughs> so he built the base cabinet for the bar, right? Which was really nice. And then, and it had no no um countertop and i'm like i'm gonna do the countertop and then like a week goes by and i go call the guy <laughs> and then got that installed and then installed the cabinet because i i didn't want the wine fridge on the floor because i don't like bending over if i can avoid it so i put the wine fridge up top and she goes all right so what do you want to do call the guy <laughs> And then I designed this really cool um, wall treatment, like 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 pallet wood. Only I'm using the staves from bourbon barrels. Cool. Ah, right? cool. Since it's a bourbon bar, and I'm a bourbon fan, I figured whiskey barrels and bourbon barrels would be pretty cool. So I got all the barrels, broke them down, kind of started mapping out what that would look like. And my wife goes, "Hey, <laughs> yeah, 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 just call the guy." <laughs> right. <laughs> well, are you also getting a robotic arm to do the actual serving no but i think that would be awesome like a, a robotic bar, robotic um bartender that can that like uses artifact uh, that uses um video recognition to find out where the right bottle is and that'd be cool that'd be awesome but no no i'm not gonna do that <laughs> well, at least not yourself no. all the guy all the guy all the guys so, so the guy will be here he was supposed to be here today. I don't think he's going to make it today, but he'll end up he'll end up being here early next week to finish it. And we decided we're going to sell the house in the next couple of months and buy another one. <laughs> Where the very first thing I do when we move in is, hey, babe, call the guy. Because <laughs> we'll be building another bourbon wall. And I'm really not looking forward to moving 500 bottles of liquor. Maybe you'll look out and you'll luck out and the new place will in fact already have a bar of your dreams. 
I don't, again, I have 500 bottles. We've looked at a couple of places that have had bars and it's actually been the reason that I've said those houses won't work for us. I can't, what am I gonna do with a place that holds 30 bottles? Have you seen the bar in the show Lucifer? Yes, that's kind of what I need. (laughs) I see, that's a pretty big bar. Fully lit, like I need far more chaos in my bar situation. Right, got it. So it sounded a little bit stressful what you guys have been going through this week. Uh, I have had a little bit of stress on, on my side too, <laughs> but uh, those contractors and 500 bottles, I can imagine 500 pounds of coffee, <laughs> or 500 bottles of whiskey, ah, you need to be careful. Um, doesn't that stress you out? So I'm actually convinced that the 500 bottles will be a major negotiation in my estate. Cause I don't, I don't actually drink that much. Like I drink about six ounces of liquor a week on an, on, on a good week. This last week I had maybe two ounces. Now, so there's no six way. Drinks or two drinks. Say what? Is that six drinks or two drinks? Yeah. It's generally like I do a little, a little oh, like one ounce pour and I sit down and on the couch and I read something or type something and I sip on my little one ounce of liquor and, and that's it. That's, that's the most that I drink in a, in a day. And then, that's what I don't uh, drink because I, I will be out of a job. I don't <laughs> <laughs> like I drink, I drink literally like seven cups of coffee a day. So, no, 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 I'm convinced most of the liquor I have, I'll have when I, that it will still be in the cabinet when I die. Matter of fact, more than half of the bottles will likely still be sealed when I finally, you know, <laughs> when they're negotiating my, my estate. So you had a, were you uh, going ahead with, with uh, Carlos's perspective on stress? <laughs> I'm just not making it like some weeks I make it super easy. Some weeks. Eh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it, it sounded like we have had a stressful week. We were talking before we had different conversations about different things with the way that we're working out from home now as permanent, technically people are actually getting a little bit anxious. What do you think about that? Is there a term for that? Is it, are we, uh, going forward with something that we probably are pioneering? We probably yeah, so, do a trade market. So I've seen, a, I've seen it a lot, especially, especially in the new year, right? Like I think people were rolling up in December going, things are going to be different in 2021. There's a new year. And for some reason, we've kind of said it in the Western mind that new year means something new. And it just kind of rolled into the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. Same day, same year. Oh God, it's a continuation of 2020. Um, and the kind of stress from work from home has begun to, to settle in and feel normal rather than abnormal. Um, and it's really become stress ops, right? It's really become this, this kind of thing where meetings start when your day starts. It's all Zoom calls or team calls or whatever. Um, and then it just ends an hour after your day normally would have ended. Hmm. And You know, my favorite is, and I I think we've all seen it, right? You get up in the morning, you look at your calendar and you go, oh, oh, look at that glorious hour, that white slot in Outlook. There's nothing there. Oh, that's fantastic. And you go through your first meeting and you're focused on your, your, your display and you're watching everyone else and you're just looking forward to, I got two hours before that, before that glorious white hour. You, you click the end button or the leave button or the finish button and you look down and where did my glorious hour go? Oh, I got a message that says, hey, I found a spare hour on your calendar. So I booked something. Right. And there went my glorious hour of freedom that I was hoping to use to get some actual work done. Uh, or maybe it's just me. I don't know. So what's the what's the distinct difference between two years ago in today. So let's say I went into the office, I I did my commute, I went into the office, I went to a few meetings, um, I took a few calls and I took my commute back home. How is today distinctly different than that world? I think there's three things at play and I'm gonna try to remember the third one by the time I finish the first one so I can actually say three (laughs) things. But the first one is um, I don't see anybody anymore. 
right? And so I can't really break down the six or seven minutes that we kind of ran into each other in the hallway and I got to catch up with my team or my coworkers or my peers or the people I needed to communicate with where we'd really quickly be able to exchange something and then move on. Um, so I got to book a meeting for that, right? So a lot of the white space that's filled up is one-on-one -on -one time. Right. Um, that ends up being things that would have been handled in the white space throughout the week that gets crammed into a half an hour that's never long enough and an hour that's slightly too long mm -hmm. kind of spaces, right? Um, the second one is um, I used to be able to see by looking at people and kind of wandering around, you know, in the time, and again, that space in between as you move through the office, um, how busy people were. And I would, you would just exclude them from meetings because no, that guy's busy as hell, got something else going on. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to do that. Right. And now it's really easy just to click add, 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 because we never get up and move to a conference room. We just all hop on a Teams chat. Yep. And then three, and this is the one that becomes dangerous. Um, we're social beings. And it's a combination of people no longer being people, right? But rather characters on the TV screen. Right. And I don't get the social interaction any other way. And so it's kind of social interaction, right? It's kind of that, it's kind of an evil combination, right? It's almost interactive characterized television. Right. Right. Um, we like to think that this is real, but, but it's not actually real. And your brain knows for a fact it's not real. Um, and so there's a little bit less consideration for what exists outside of the call you're on, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, you know, you saw, right? There was a posting on LinkedIn and uh, um, I commented and you and I had a little bit of a back and forth, right? But my comment was effectively, um, meetings need to be restricted from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. with a break for lunch, or, or uh, sorry, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. with a break for lunch. Right. Um, and I firmly believe that like if, 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 if we all went into an office, right, I live in Denver. So if we all went into an office in Denver normally, and now we're working from home, meetings should be restricted from 10 to three with a break for lunch. Right. You replied, of course, saying, what do you do with a federated team? And, and I think my reply was somewhere along the lines of the suck it up. Right? Suck it up is what I got. I mean, it kind of it it it's kind of like try to do the same thing, but but we kind of have to suck it up, right? As leaders, we take the hit. We don't push the hit down on our people. Um, but but that's what I'm seeing. So, are you seeing the same? Are you seeing something different? So I have a unifying theory that I literally unifying. just thought of in the last. Wait, wait, is this the unifying theory of stress ops? <laughs> <laughs> The unifying theory of stress off simply is this small talk. Small talk used to be within your control, right? You would seek out another person and make small talk, or you were forced in an in person meeting and therefore you have small talk. That has now expanded dramatically. Now it's small talk for every single meeting. What used to be a flyby, a 10 minute conversation, hey, should it be A, B or C? Somebody says C and you walk away. Or should we turn left or should we turn right? Somebody says right and you walk away. Now is a one hour meeting with 10 minutes of small talk to open it up, 10 minutes of small talk to close it every single meeting. What used to be a 15 minute total small talk every day is now a two hour small talk every day. That is incredibly stressful, especially for technology introverts. Imagine now having to have a, an opinion on the weather effectively every single hour. That's interesting because in every meeting, now that you mention it like that, literally in every meeting, I don't have a problem talking about it and everybody want to be in Miami. <laughs> right. Oh, Miami is great. I'm like, yeah, but it's getting cold. But it used to it be with not getting control. cold in Miami. <laughs> Stop saying <laughs> Toronto's right there. Denver's right here. It is not getting cold in Miami. The <laughs> coldest it gets in Miami is a nice summer day with a breeze in Denver. Right. But just imagine what used to be an email or arguably should be an email. Now is an hour meeting. What used to be a flyby to somebody's office quick in and out, knock on the door, is now an hour meeting. What used to be a, a cordial, friendly conversation at lunch, 
now is an hour meeting. It's just constantly on top of you. Um, and the reality is um, now that two hours of your day is small talk, that's two hours of not doing other work. Yep, but 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 if you notice the work doesn't go away. The work does not go away. Right? And so it gets pushed into the white space and the white space is actually time not owned by your employer. Yep. Right? Your employer owns eight hours of your day. That's what they pay you for, eight hours of the day. Not 10, not 12, not, not 15, not 16. Eight hours of the day. And I think at some point we forgot that. We just went, well, you know, I guess you, like you had to drive in before. So it's not really different. Yeah. You'd have been in your car. Yeah, but, but in my car, I'm probably listening to a podcast or an audio book or NPR or the radio or, you know what I mean? And yeah, it's stressful to be in traffic, but it was still my time. And then on the way home, I actually get in, it's the thing that I miss the most. Um, the drive home is actually what I miss the most. I never liked it, right? But in that time, I closed the door on work and I opened the door on family. And, and being a tech introvert, right? Like you were just saying, that's, that actually is something that's required for me. Right. Now I have the 22 seconds it takes me to walk from my desk to the living room right? Where now I'm sitting next to my wife and I haven't had the 25 minutes I had before to unwind. Right. Instead, I have 22 seconds. So I'm not unwound. That's right. right? Be- not in family mode. I'm still in work mode. And then I get family mode thrown on top of that, right? The weight from, hey, now you have to interact with us. Hey, now we have to figure out dinner. Now we have our family activities, all that stuff without ever turning off the work mode. Right. Right. And, and I think we really, like, I think we're, I think we're in dangerous waters. Um, and, and I think it's dangerous waters too, to tell people, hey, you know that nice cozy space you made for yourself at home? Yeah, we're gonna turn that off and have you come back in the office. Like, I don't think coming back in the office is a solution either. Do you think proof of productivity is also changed over time? So not, not to say that we did this, but on occasion, you'd go into the office and sit in your cubicle and do work. And then arguably, that was proof of productivity. Your manager would come around, notice you were at your desk, seeing a you know, laptop open, you know, PowerPoint was there, you're making a modification. Even if the ultimate outcome, outcome was nothing, it was still proof of productivity. Now, because none of that occurs at all, you actually have to produce output on a semi-regular basis, and that's actually adding the stress. There's no easy days because every day needs to produce an outcome that is easily easily accessible uh, and uh, and articulable to your manager or to the team as a whole. So, and a lot of managers, how they measured you was not by the output, but by the drive-by, right? By the presence. Correct. And so the presence is now the team meeting, right? Which is not productive time in the way that like, if, if, if I was productive before and my manager walked by and kind of peeked and kept walking, okay, like you might disrupt my thought. I can kind of get back to it because it's maybe five minutes. Right. Right. So, okay, I've lost five minutes. I've lost maybe, maybe I've lost 10 minutes, right? Lost the thought for five minutes, have to find five minutes to find the thought. Okay, fine. Right. Now, no, it's an hour and I'm not finding that thought again. That train has left the station, <laughs> right? Right. So now I got to go back to, oh crap, where was I? Uh, I got like 12 other windows open because we were in the middle of a conversation. Every time there's a conversation, you're open and stuff to find what the conversation's about. Now I have to close all those windows and find all, reopen all the windows that were my working product and kind of get back into whatever mode it was for whatever I was thinking about at the time. Cause you know, we're knowledge workers, not task workers. So I can't just drop into a task, right? right? It's, it's hugely disruptive. And in many cases I'll lose, you know, I'll lose two hours a day just from the, the task switching because the task switching takes so long. And not only is it work task switching, but also it's work home task switching. Because since you're in your den, in your office, to which you both work and pay bills, right? And negotiate contracts and search for your vacation, then you're likely to do both of those things throughout the entire day, all day, every day, weekends, right? Weekend, a weekend is the same as a weekday. I'm going to do as much work as I am going to do as much home things because I'm in front of my computer, I might as well answer that email. Yep. You know, that is interesting that you mentioned that about a week ago, 
on Friday, it was not that I was feeling burned out, but now that you mention what, like I was realizing that I was doing something like that. And I decided to leave and not get back into my office. And that's rare for me, because like you said, is where I like, here's what I also produce, like the podcast, what I do, all this stuff. And I felt so (laughs) overwhelmed and I couldn't understand why. Just the thought of going back or even with my laptop, like I could sit down with my laptop on the living room. And then I started thinking, I'm seeing that people don't want to get their work measured. You mentioned about getting the output. Mm-hmm. And I was working on a project and I created a, a report about what, we were, what was happening. And the people in the project started getting upset because now there was an automated way to show the progress. Right. Now you mentioned it. Is that something that could be adding stress that before, like you mentioned, there was not a real way of measuring the output and now we have to find ways to actually show that progress but more specifically sometimes just being present equaled productive right and now because you're not present so you have to produce you have to produce output greater than just being present which is incredibly stressful we have to produce output and proof of output and proof of it yeah Right? It's it's this awful kind of new thing, um, yeah. And it and it has to. I've, I'm also seeing a lot more player coaches being more player than coach than they were before. Mm-hmm. Right? Like you would coach in person because you'd go sit in a cubicle together and share a keyboard and you know, hey, let me show you how to do this thing so you can do it in the future. Right? Um, like it was easier to be a coach when people are there. I could find time to squeeze in, but there were a, there was a ton of time where I'd be doing something. Right. right, or preparing to do something, and I'd stop, and I, I, I just hit somebody in the office up. Hey, you haven't done this thing before. I'm about to do it. Would you like to come into my office and take some notes and do it? Right. You don't have that option anymore. And it's a real problem for leadership, right? If I'm a developer, I have real output, right? I'm producing code. That code gets, uh, gets submitted into the code repository, and I get to do quality assurance on it, right? There's, there's a literal thing that I'm producing. But series of leaderships, including up to the CTO, so most of your day might simply be decisions. Turn left, turn right, choose this, choose that, buy this, don't buy that. Well, what, how do you measure something? Right. Like, how do you measure decisions? It's almost impossible, right? The CEO is going to say, are you producing output? Well, I made 100 decisions. Would right. you like me to go through them with you? No, it's a, it's a weird articulation of that. Yeah, and I think I think that that leads to a lot more reports, right? Mm-hmm. We we need we now need to better articulate what we do because no one can see it, right? The seeing isn't as obvious, so now we have to produce reports so that people can better see what we're doing, right? Right, and and you know I find myself in that in that very situation now. Right? Thank God for the currency report, so at least I know what report I'm building. But it's not just seeing. Now people can evaluate and provide um perspective on you used to make a hundred decisions a day nobody was evaluating whether that was enough maybe it sure. should be 100. Sure. <laughs> or maybe they're micromanaging and say you know what this three i would have chosen the opposite decision it's like yeah. you don't have the time or energy to reevaluate everything you've done well and trust is another one right um it's it's easy to build trust with your peer group now and i find i find it's faster Right, because even especially at the leadership level, where you're tangentially related to your peers, right? We work in the same department, but the reality is, in the office, our our desks are 600 feet away. Maybe not even in the same office. Right. Now we're all in the same teams, right? And so we're building that that kind of the kind of trust with the, and rapport with each other faster. Outside of our peer group, oh no, no, we're not, no, no, quite the opposite. Because we used to run into each other in the office. We, we'd often even have lunch together, right? Sure. Five or six of us would just go, hey, we're going to have lunch. Let's go have lunch. And you'd build your, your trust repository that way. Right. With people that, that you otherwise, you know, you interacted with when you did a project that happened to touch them. Now, the only time is when you have a 
project that's going to touch their team, their group, their kind of, you know, domain or silo. And the tough part is like you would fill a bank of trust based on all the casual interaction. Well, that's, and then you'd, you'd kind of start from there and build and, you know, and you'd work and, and there was always this kind of, oh no, that's, you know, yeah, you know, something broke, something didn't go right, but you know what? Howard really, Howard has it because I trust Howard. Right. No way to build that trust now. Yeah. Right? Especially if you just got hired and right. you've literally never met any of these people in person. That yep. this, this window is the only window you have into this person. And as you can see with the three of us, you don't even know what our houses look like. <laughs> that, that's a really good point because you used to be able to connect with people as you were walking or eating. Now we're only connecting through what we can see on the little square. Right. And I don't if it's really big know meeting, how tall anyone is, right? I don't really know how firm their handshake is. I don't really know if they're fast walkers or slow walkers. These make pretty big differences in whether we're going to be pals or not. Yeah, I tend to, I, I tend to agree. And it is, it is a bit unfortunate. So how do we resolve this if it's resolvable? Or at least how can we reduce the stress, <laughs> the stress ops in some way? So, so again, reduce the number of meetings, yeah. right? Pick a window that's a four hour window, right? Mine was five because I added lunch in the middle, but pick a window that's four hours. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be a contiguous window. It could be, you know, I've got people distributed around the world. So the window is like eight to 10 and three to five. Mm -hmm. Cool, but that's it, that's it. No more meetings outside of that, right? Look, the further up in leadership you get, the more meetings your, your days are full of, yep. but it's really about respecting your people, right? So if you're at the manager director level, four hours is your limit. You're still a player coach, you still have stuff to do, four hours, right? No more than six, not ever, not even once. And that counts workshops, that counts status meetings, that counts everything that has Teams or Zoom or I don't know, do people still use GoToMeeting? Like whatever you happen to use, right? right? Four hours, that's it, right? And then like, to be honest, we're starting to get vaccinated and COVID is dropping. Maybe start thinking about doing things in person in April and May, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, get together for, my company currently has meetings that are long meetings that are all strategy meetings that previously would have been a dinner. Right. <laughs> Far less stress at a dinner. Right. Right. And, and all of us, right. It constantly, this would have been a dinner. Would have loved to have taken everyone to dinner. Right. Right. And look. Far less formal. Right. Uh, people are far more open to, to potential decisions or potential changes when, you know, they got a glass of wine in their hand. And you have breakout conversations, right? You have this kind of, kind of, especially when you get to a table of like ten or more. Yeah, natural break. Can't hear someone all the way at the other end. I can't really participate in that conversation. So we're going to break into little smaller conversations, right. and then that gets kind of rumbled around, and pretty soon a new idea is found. Right? They're great for brainstorming. Can't really do them the same way anymore, right? Um, and then the other thing is, if you're the leader and you have a bunch of people that report to you. Pick one hour a day every day that everyone is invited to, all of them are optional, and they can drop in and drop out during that hour. Right. It's the it's your open door policy. Correct. Yeah. And it is called the open door meeting or my open door or the time during which I'm going to sit at my desk and, and eat lunch or listen to a podcast and anyone can drop in and drop out for any reason. Right. Right. And, and I honestly, I think if you don't have that, you're making a huge mistake. And, and okay, cool, you can't find right now, you can't flip a light switch, your calendar's pretty built, you can't do one hour a day every day. Click forward two weeks on your calendar and find an hour every day. Right. Because right. Right? there's probably one that's gonna bubble up. And if you're the CIO, you're the CTO, right? You're the senior VP, um, set it to your lunch. Right, sure. You're not likely leaving for lunch. And do you really care if you're snacking on a sandwich when somebody hops in? Tell them it's lunch, it's the lunch hour. Yeah. Fine. Bring your sandwich. Bring your, exactly. Right. And on the off chance that you need to have a team meeting at seven o'clock in the morning, order food and have it delivered to their house. Right. You're doing it at five o'clock, order food and have it delivered to their house. Right. Right. Like 
create it as this is something unordinary. So I'm going to take an extra step. Right. Right. And, and encourage it, make it a little bit more team building, make it a little less formal. And not pizza. Like you send them something nice, right? I don't care if it's pizza this once. Is fast food. I know, I don't I know where you coupon. one. Yeah, I, I don't I don't actually care where where it is, right? And and you could even go, hey, look, this meeting's gonna be at this time. Um, you know, y'all have fifty dollars on your expense report to do Uber Eats. That's right. Whatever you want to do, right? Fifty dollars. I'll pay the first fifty dollars of of however big the bill is. I don't, you know, yeah. care, or whatever you want. Or order something. Just don't order pizza every time. I'm cool with pizza once. <laughs> then do. go do sandwiches, then do Indian food or Chinese, I, you know, I don't care, whatever works for you, but. So I'll extend some of your suggestions. So, so I would recommend actually creating an artificial commute time. So I spend a good portion of my time, let's say an hour in the morning before I'll start any work. That's when I read the tweets. That's when I read the RSS. I'm sitting on the couch. I'm not sitting in the office, but I'm already dressed. I'm already dressed. I'm ready. Arguably, I'm ready for work but I am going to spend dedicated time not doing work before I actually get to work. And then the same kind of thing at the end. I'm going to still in my attire and I'm gonna to go to another location. Maybe it's outside, maybe I'm taking the dog for a walk. I'm doing something else uh, to, to be that difference in time between work and home. And I'm a big fan of physically leaving the house get out of the house, even if it's just a walk, maybe it's a quick drive to the coffee store, maybe it's just a drive around the corner. <laughs> do whatever you need to do, get not only a different room in the house, but completely different outside and smell, you know, smell the smells, the fresh air, the whatever is to make that happen. Um, I would also encourage um, much smaller meetings, right? If it doesn't, if it can be 15 minutes, make it 15 minutes. If it can be half an hour, make it half an hour. One hour isn't a default meeting. That's not appropriate. Um, and then just finally block your time, right? Actually put hours in your days that you, in fact, looks like you're busy. Somebody else blocked this time. It just happens to be you. Right. Yeah. What do you think about the, a lot of small meetings? I've been encountering those lately. They sent me like a 15 minute meeting and I have probably like seven of those one after the other one. No, 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 that's wicked exhaustion, exhausting. Because mm -hmm. all you're doing is task switching over and over and over again. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You still work in hour blocks, but you can have a one 15 minute window meeting in that block. Right. <laughs> it changes the way you manage your calendar. You have to put in a lot more physical blocks yourself just to ensure yeah. that it doesn't happen. So, so I physically block most of my calendar, especially so, so one of the things that I would suggest, and I would suggest it right now, block your calendar from 5.30 p.m. to midnight and from midnight to 7.30 a.m. <laughs> right. Permanent block, it's recurring, it has no end date. Right. Right, then someone's going to get a red X next to your name when they try to schedule a meeting and they at least have to reach out and say, hey, I know you have something during this time, but we really, I really need you to make this. And they can't just randomly throw crap on your calendar and expect, no, no, sir, that time was already blocked. You don't get to, you don't get to just call an audible and say, oops, I didn't, I wouldn't pay any attention. Yeah, yeah, you're required to pay attention to the fact that I have no availability during that time, right? And force them to talk to you before booking a time on your calendar that is out of working hours, period, end of statement. You can then, be even more extreme and just block your calendar entirely. You absolutely could. <laughs> and now it's meeting by exception. The yep. only time you'll ever accept a meeting is when they reach out, just like you said, yep. and beg for that time. <laughs> and then block an, an hour and a half every day around lunchtime. Right. Because you know it's going to bleed, but, but it's important. That break is important. The break doesn't exist because your employer is nice to you. Right. Right. The break exists because you have to be able to take a reset. So block some time in your calendar, block your breaks, block yeah. everything. Just, just put blocks, put a block at 10 o'clock to 10, 15, put a block at two o'clock to two fifteen. right? Be prepared to give it up, but make them ask. 
technology wise, I'm seriously considering separating my devices. A light laptop for work that does not have access to my personal content. Two phones. Uh, and even wow. changing my physical presence. My personal laptop will stay in the kitchen and I will use it in the kitchen and it will not have access to work email. <laughs> well, this is in the kitchen, but they, yeah, exactly. No, so but 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 I get exactly what you're saying. That don't have access to each other sitting in physically different places. Yep. The other thing that I found works is um because I don't like to disconnect my my laptop from its docking station, right? My work laptop, because you know how that goes, right? And nothing nothing ever resets completely. Yeah. Um, get an iPad or a tablet, can be as cheap as you want. Get it connected to your work teams or a Zoom. And then if the meeting is just a meeting, you're not having to look crap up, go sit outside. Yeah. Right? Go sit on the porch, go sit on your deck, go like throw headphones in if you don't have to be on video and, and go for a walk, yeah. go pace, do something. I find that helps me a lot. Good point. Those are good but points. Good talk. But yeah, after work hours, this thing, my work phone stays in my office. Nice. My supervisor has my personal if he needs to text something. And that's there's it. Such, Not, there's no there's such thing as a CTO emergency. Right. <laughs> Sorry, doesn't exist. <laughs> and that's a valuable advice. Unless you're lost in the Malaysian jungle. <laughs> There's no emergency. In which case, I couldn't help you anyways. <laughs> I'm sorry, my Malaysian map doesn't work. I don't, I don't, I don't know what you're expecting. If you can call me, why don't you, why don't you call the rescue services? I don't. Know. <laughs> it doesn't work at all. Oh, well, friends, there you have it. You look at what you're doing, the time that you're spending on work, because you may be going at, towards an area that is bringing stress to your people and eventually going to add stress to you as a leader. So make sure that you subscribe and you share this with your team so we can continue to grow and be the leaders that we can be. We'll see you on our next episode.